You see ads for months. You hear your friends talk about it. You become interested. Trailers show more footage. You slowly become more and more excited. The day finally comes. You get in the car. You walk into the theater. You fill up your vanilla Coke Zero. Grab yourself some popcorn. You get set in your seat. And as the lights begin to dim, the movie starts. And you watch. The movie ends, and you leave the theater, and after all this time, the only thing you can think is, what the hell is this? I don't know about you guys, but this seems to happen to me more and more. There's something off about modern movies. And to be clear, not every film that comes out is terrible. There are many examples in the last 10 years, such as Everything Everywhere All at Once, Get Out, Avengers Infinity War, The Whale, The Lego Movie, Mission Impossible Fallout, La La Land, The Planet of the Apes Trilogy, just to name a few different types. But you know what I mean when I say modern movies kind of suck. Look at the failing MCU movies, barring an exception every now and then. The terrible Star Wars movies and TV shows, again, barring an exception every now and then. The Transformers movies, sorry Jake. The Netflix movies that are pumped out every six seconds, Fast X, Uncharted. Basically the entire DC universe since Man of Steel, kind of. Morbius. Every Illumination movie after Despicable Me, yeah that's right, every four year old come fight me, don't worry darling, comedies like Baywatch or Chips, or nearly every single legacy sequel dumped out for the past 20 years, barring Top Gun Maverick. Look, I could go on for quite a while, I really, truly could. But I think we all know about the disappointment of going to the movies nowadays, and I want to break down just why that is. Now, to be fair, there are a whole host of reasons, and narrowing it down to just one would be disingenuous. With the sheer amounts of content created for not only theatrical releases, but for the infinite streaming services too, causing the quality of each project to inevitably falter, the studio interference on big budget productions that simply spend too much money to be given creative freedom, to the overuse of CGI to create a spectacle instead of relying on a more necessarily grounded script. There are many problems with the film industry today. And that's not even touching on the problem of film now largely relying on portraying an understanding of emotion rather than an experience of emotion, or film now lacking the fundamental understanding that actions should have consequences, so every action a character takes must have some tangible consequence, no matter how small. But I want to take a look at one reason today, that in spite of all of these other factors, movies today are just not as good as they used to be. And that reason is simply sincerity. Look, like I said before, movies can have a whole host of reasons for why they suck. But the lack of sincerity when telling these stories, when writing these characters, is, is something that I've been noticing a lot more frequently in the last, you know, five, six, maybe even ten years. And I believe that it's ruining cinema. But first, I need to explain what I mean by sincerity when it relates to a movie. A movie being genuine firstly must mean it proceeds from truth, or at the very least, without deceit. But what does it mean to be true in this context? I think we can say a movie is most true when it allows its characters to be full human beings, meaning its characters are able to experience loss and suffering just as much as they are able to experience love and joy. And not only should these characters be able to experience these things, they should be reactive to these emotions in a way that is not only believable to how the characters have acted before, but how an audience could reasonably expect another human being to act. And lastly, for a movie to be sincere, it needs to allow time for both the characters and the audience to absorb the emotion of a particular poignant scene or line of dialogue or any external action that defines the message of the movie or a lesson a character must learn or a challenge the character has to overcome. So to sum up what makes a movie sincere in my eyes is, one, a movie must be true to the human experience, Two, a character must be allowed to react to emotional moments. Three, a film should allow time for processing for both the character as well as the audience. 
Okay, we have our definition of what makes a movie sincere, but I think we should look at a movie that I believe is sincere versus one that is not, so that we can see an example of what I'm talking about. We're going to look at Spider-Man 2 and Thor Love and Thunder. And yes, I know they're both superhero movies and I'm supposed to have a film degree so I have to exclusively talk about Citizen Kane or Fight Club or the... Uh, uh... Over the Hedge. But they're both technically in the same genre of film and both sequels and are the easiest comparisons I can make for this point. All other issues aside, and there are plenty in Thor 4. I want to look at a conversation between two love interests in each of the films, so to do that let's recap both films up until that point just so everybody knows where we're at. Starting with Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Peter has been Spider-Man for two years now, he's struggling to balance the superhero life with having a life as Peter Parker. His best friend wants his alter ego dead and seems consumed by this. The girl of his dreams wants to be with him, but he's unable to connect with her because of fears of the dangers she could be in with his alter ego. His aunt is running out of money since his uncle has died, Peter is struggling to show up for his college classes, and he's barely able to afford any money being a pizza delivery guy and a photographer for the Daily Bugle. Being friends with Harry, he's able to meet his academic idol, Dr. Octavius, and due to the doctor's hubris, his experiment accidentally kills his wife and causes him to be attached to metal arms and slowly drive away his inhibitions. Meanwhile, Peter begins to lose his powers, and after not being able to be there for MJ yet again, the worst night of his life occurs. MJ agrees to marry another man, his best friend slaps him, he's not able to get any pictures or even a drink. And then after a brutal conversation with Uncle Ben, he gives up his powers as Spider-Man. Peter finally catches a break being able to excel at his classes, seeing MJ's play, and overall has a weight taken off of him. However, his sense of duty still plagues him as he comes across a burning building. He decides to save a child who is trapped inside, and he does so. However, it turns out someone else was trapped on a different floor. Someone Spider-Man could have saved. Peter, lost, reveals to Aunt May what he had been storing inside for two years. I'm responsible. He is responsible for Uncle Ben's death. And Aunt May doesn't forgive him immediately either. And as Doc Ock prepares to finalize his machine, Peter gets an amazing pep talk from his aunt that basically confirms that she knows he's Spidey and then fails to reactivate his powers. And that's the groundwork for Spider-Man 2. So let's go to Thor Love and Thunder. So Gore loses his daughter and vows to kill all the gods. Meanwhile, Thor is hanging with the Guardians and learns of a distress signal from Sif. So he parts ways with them only to find Sif almost dead, claiming that Gore would be coming for new Asgard. So Thor heads to his home only to find Jane Foster wielding his old hammer Mjolnir. Only she has cancer now, but Thor doesn't know that. Gore escapes, kidnapping a bunch of the Asgardian children, and the team of Thors decide to enlist the help of Zeus. They get to the city and Zeus doesn't really want to help. A fight scene ensues and Thor throws Zeus's lightning bolt through Zeus. They steal the lightning bolt weapon to use against Thor, and now they're on their way to the Shadow Realm. And that's where we are in Thor 4. I want to compare the following scenes, which obviously I, I can't play in their entirety, but I'll, you know, I'll put a little time code in the film uh, or a link to the video where you can watch it. I'll put that in the description. Don't worry about it. Anyway, I'm going to try to refrain from commentary while I get through a kind of short dissection of the scene. And the point I want to make is that one of these films handles a conversation where two people try to explain themselves in a sincere way and the other film tries to explain emotion in a fast-paced way so as to seem comedic. Starting with Spider-Man 2, Peter enters a cafe, MJ inviting him there previously off-screen. They start off with quick pleasantries that turn into Peter trying to find out why MJ wanted to meet him. She seems nervous, almost unable to put her thoughts into words. She starts trying to explain herself with an anecdote and quickly tries to get out her thoughts. She says she didn't want to listen to him before because she didn't trust him after unintentionally letting her down many times before. But now she's had a change of heart. However, Peter, since he's planning on becoming Spider-Man again, cuts her off. 
Peter meekly tries to walk back what he told her in previous scenes, and MJ cuts him off, obviously upset about what he's trying to do. Peter then uses the anecdote MJ used, my mind was playing tricks too. We get a brief pause as Peter pulls himself back, putting a wall up between them. MJ asks him bluntly, Do you love me? The camera pushes in as we see Peter fight himself to lie to her, I don't. He knows he's lying, but more importantly, she knows he's lying. He is implicitly, but obviously, trying to distance himself, even though MJ doesn't know why yet. MJ decides to go for broke. Her last ditch effort to connect with Peter before she leaves him forever is to ask him to kiss her. Peter was clearly not expecting this, but she stills his fears by placing her hand on his. She leans in, Peter leans in too. She needs to know, in an almost fairy tale sense, that Peter is the one. And Peter relents because, well, I mean, he really does love her, and maybe he can keep the memory of their shared kiss as one thing to keep him going since he plans on never seeing her again. And also, let's be honest, he's simping real hard. But of course, a car's thrown at them, and he saves her from that before Doc Ock kidnaps her, and then we get the greatest fight in a superhero movie ever made. And in the Thor Love and Thunder scene, Jane and Thor are on a ship traveling to beat the bad guy and save the day. Thor comments on the scenery, with both of them glancing at each other, clearly wanting to talk about something. Something. Thor initiates, saying very quickly that, I want to feel shitty about you. That doesn't sound anything like him. Oh, I want to feel shitty about you. To the confusion of Jane. He explains that it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Again, very nervously. Thor explains his emotional state and why he's been acting like he has. Jane hears him, but it's unclear if she's really listening, as she wants to say something to Thor. They talk about how meditation is boring, and Thor says he wants to be with Jane. He asks her what she thinks about that, and she replies, I have cancer. As anybody would be, Thor is confused by that answer, and Jane tries to leave, but then stops herself from leaving, then awkwardly states that was a joke, but actually no it wasn't. Thor says he's sorry, but Jane says she doesn't want Thor's sympathy. She explains what happened in the past six months and ends by saying, I think it's getting better. Maybe not. Thor tries to console her by saying things like, we don't know how long we have left, and Mjolnir chose you, which means you're worthy. He then explains that Jane is the one who made him worthy and that he'll do whatever she wants because they can do it together. She says she wants to save the stolen kids, and Thor asks how she feels about that. She answers, scared. She reverses the question, and Thor replies, shitty. They kiss, and they continue on their journey to stop the bad guy. All right, so I know that this is not a one-to-one -one comparison. Spider-Man 2's scene is about two people who love each other but can't communicate due to one or the other blocking the other person. Thor 4's scene is about two people who love each other but one has a secret that has prevented them from reconciling. And again, this scene comparison is not about the cinematography or the plot of the movie, nor is this analysis supposed to be about which one I personally like more. I merely want to look at these issues that these characters have and then how they communicate these problems is what I'm looking at. As well as why through this lens, we start to see the problem with modern movies and their inability to be sincere. In the cafe scene, I genuinely think the acting is more realistic even if the dialogue is less so. The dialogue in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy is oftentimes corny, but in these intimate scenes, they're less a reflection of how people talk and more a type of poetry. An excellent example of this is the hospital scene from the first Spider-Man movie. And while this can be mocked, sure, I get it, the scene specifically excels at performance. The scene is dynamic for both characters without needing to show the highest expressions. What I mean by that is we can travel up and down in terms of emotional states without the need to act out those in-point emotions like laughing or crying. This is how I would define subtle performance within the context of subtextual dialogue, of course. Also, the dialogue, again, not being exactly how you or I may talk, manages to let the characters be vulnerable without the use of curse words. Now, anybody who has watched this channel before knows that I am no prude when it comes to cursing, you 
fucking idiots. However, there is a time and a place for it. And just like when you are sharing your most vulnerable feelings with another, especially when the other person has no clue what you're about to say, you don't typically curse during that time. Look, I know this may be hard to understand, but the vast majority of people only curse when they're angry. Now, a large portion of people curse when they're joking, and even quite a few just in their daily lives. However, almost none of these people do it when they are sharing their positive feelings the other person does not know that they possess to another person's face. And of course, like any scene in a movie, this scene forwards the plot, yes, but it also progresses the character arcs of both characters while also advancing the theme. But not only does it do all three of these things, but it manages to have two people talk about what they want while also disagreeing about what they want. At least on the surface, because Peter does actually want what MJ wants, but he's denying himself that. So. The reason this is so crucial to the scene is because it creates a little thing you may have heard of called drama. It's not two people who want the same thing. It's two people who do not want the same thing, but still care about each other. That inherently brings drama with it. It's a genuine disagreement between two good people. In the space boat scene, however, the dialogue, while being possibly more realistic, at least to a younger millennial to Gen A crowd, which I suppose is the target audience for this movie, lacks any weight. There's no gravitas to the dialogue in a scene where two characters are scared to tell each other something very personal that's been on their mind, yet no, they have to do it now because they might die. Instead of something poetic like we may have seen in the first Thor movie, and I guess a little bit in the second one as well, uh, anyways, or even a simple yet honest line about how Thor feels, he says he wants to feel shitty. Yeah, I understand that it's a callback to what Star-Lord said earlier in the film, and I get that it's so random XD, ha ha ha. But when characters talk like this, how are we supposed to actually care about them? There's no relatability. There is no depth here. There's nothing to grab onto and think, wow, I've felt that way before. Because even if you can relate to the sentiment, and I understand being able to relate to that sentiment, it would be extremely cringe of you to say that in a moment like the one in this scene. This applies to Jane's character as well, but her character more so suffers from the problem of shifting priorities in the scene without a clear reason to act that way. Yes, she's nervous. Yes, she's scared. Yes, she's worried about dying in a couple ways at this point. But the attempt at awkward humor where she takes back what she said only to take back the take back is just really poorly written. And when things don't make sense like that, and when the characters themselves don't take the scene seriously, and when there's not actually a disagreement between them, there are no stakes. And if there's no drama, then the movie is boring and loses the nearly entire purpose of its existence. So, if it's not already clear, the point that I'm trying to make when comparing these scenes is that one of them has a sincere character relationship, and the other chooses not to do that. And while we may be prone to blame or praise the actors for whether something is believable or not, we have to remember that everything starts first with the script. If the writing does not value genuine human expression, how is an audience supposed to ever develop a genuine human attachment? All right, I know that was a pretty extensive rundown on like two scenes, but I think they encapsulate the point I'm trying to make. And to be clear, I'm not an old movie purist. There are plenty of new films, or at the very least films that came out this century, that I would definitely enjoy. Go look at some of our movie reviews. You can see some positive ones and negative ones, and you should go check those out. And you should also subscribe to this channel. I think that's a good time to bring it up. Go ahead and do that. Thank you. However, there is clearly something about the way older films were written that I find to be superior in many aspects. And I believe that the inferiority in comparison to older writing is simply due to postmodernism. Before you get mad, let me explain. All right, you know me at this point. Let's try to define our terms, all right? Generally speaking, modernism is essentially a philosophy that intends for individualism within the society. Postmodernism, on the other hand, is a philosophical and literary theory that simply questions the a priori assumptions of modernism. And the period after postmodernism is labeled as 
post postmodernism, which honestly seems to circle somewhat back to pre-modernism in a sense. It's it's kind of it's weird, but I, I'm I'm getting way off track here. When it comes to movies, for our purposes here, we will just say that modernism is the old way in which people view the world. And yes, I know that that only extends to comparatively none of human history, but hey, stay with me here. And postmodernism is the nihilistic, ironic, undefined era that has come to define the last 30 years or so, maybe 40. And by now, most of you may be able to see where I'm going from this, but I'm gonna finish my thoughts anyways. So without getting into a whole political debate, because that is not the scope of this video at all, this philosophical theory is big stupid. Postmodernists question everything. They are basically aligned with the assassins from the Assassin's Creed series, barring the murder. This works wonder for self-important expression, where the me is the most important role in the universe. This also works well as a mean to not fall into ideological and dogmatic systems. But this doesn't actually work. If the postmodern worldview claims that there is nothing objective because even the physical world in front of you is just a representation based on your subjective senses, then how can there ever be anything good? How can there be anything bad? Is there anything that is right or wrong? In a true postmodern understanding, nothing is true, so everything must be permitted. You can see how this translates to film. If there is nothing objective, if you truly believe that, then how can you craft something someone will care about? Why should anybody care about anything at all? If we're all just meat sacks floating on a rock in space, well, I mean, that's only what we experience, and even that may not be true since there is no truth, then why are feelings about anything important? What is important? If you can't answer any of these questions, then how can you expect to craft a narrative about anything at all? To tell a story is to assume basic facts about life, like there is an existence outside of yourself, there is a physical world you can interact with, there are basic rules like gravity, like the sun rises and sets, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. I could, I could go on, like quite literally, because if the universe is infinite, I can keep going on with infinite facts. Anyways, but a postmodernist cannot truly accept these basic starting points. So what we're left with is the idea that an objective reality exists, but there's no real meaning to it beyond what we personally want. However, what we personally want should be good if you're a protagonist, and usually that includes living a life where you, at the very least, are not harming other people. Now, you can't explain to me why harming other people is bad other than suffering bad, but I would argue, what is suffering? Nothing is real. Suffering does not exist. The point being, this doesn't work. The cognitive dissonance is too strong. You make assumptions about what is right and wrong, but your own ideology prevents you from actually claiming that there is anything right or wrong in the first place. So of course this leads you to irony with every situation, which leads you straight down to the path of nihilism. Because if everything is permitted, if everything is quote unquote true, then of course nothing would matter. So how do you combat a meaningless world? Well, you just tell everybody that yeah, it's meaningless, but you can find some things personally enjoyable along the way. And this is the problem with modern movies. This is why sincerity is thrown out the door. How can you be sincere and vulnerable in a world in which nothing is real and nothing matters? How is there anything to be sincere about? After all, sincerity implies truth. And since there is no truth, of course there's nothing to be sincere about. It's so difficult to craft a narrative on this worldview because this worldview is at its core anti-narrative. When you're watching a movie and you're wondering why there's a self-deprecating joke that ruins the emotion of a scene or why a character acts as though nothing has weight to it other than some implied sense of right and wrong that is never really challenged or you're simply wondering why you don't feel anything while watching the most popular movies of the day. Yes, there are many outside factors why this might be the case. And yes, sometimes filmmakers just make mistakes. But there is no denying that the problem with modern movies is that they are unwilling or unable to be truly sincere. 
Hey everybody, thank you for watching this video essay. This is the first one post my Indiana Jones series and post the move. And you know, I'm I, I wanna eventually get some something on the wall up here. I've I've got a I've got a couple things. I just don't have the frames for them yet. So hopefully it won't be as barren next time. But before we go, I do want to couch a few things that might come up either in your head or if you feel very strongly about it might be put in the comment section. So let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. Okay, first of all, of course, I'm not referring to every single movie that comes out. Nowadays, I'm just referring to the trend. I said at the beginning of the video, a very short list of just a couple movies that I could think of off the top of my head that I didn't feel like fell into this category, even though Everything Everywhere All at Once is kind of a postmodernist film, but, but at least the characters act like something matters. That's actually the whole kind of point of the film in a sense. And I don't like the conclusion necessarily that they come to. They're like, yeah, nothing matters, but this feels good. But you know what? I'll let it slide. Yeah, you and your Oscars can go slide. Uh, secondly, I know I didn't explain those philosophical concepts fully, and I know that I didn't maybe explain them in a way that you would have assumed the answer to be, or maybe you truly do believe that they should be defined. That's fine. You can do a reading on your own. You can comment below um, how you think your definition of modernism, postmodernism, post postmodernism, pre-modernism, how all of that's defined. I was using that for the for the purposes of the video. And to be honest, like I'm not wrong on it. Uh, again, I just didn't go in as much depth as maybe is needed to explain a concept that is so <laughs> unable to be defined. But yeah, I was using the sociological definitions in a way that could relate to film. I'm not teaching a class on it. And finally, I know that I used a lot of superhero footage in the video here, and you might go, oh, you watch the superhero movies. Look, I know the genre is pretty, is getting on its last legs here, uh, but it's still the most culturally relevant and defining medium, or I guess genre that exists today. So I'm just trying to play to the largest common denominator, if you know what I mean. All right, well, that'll do it for me. Uh, I really do hope that you enjoyed this video. Um, and hey, leave a like, comment, subscribe, all, all the good stuff there. I've been Kyle, and I still am. And this has been Why Modern Movies Suck.